Hey friends, welcome back to another episode of Refrigerant Checkup. First of all, I'd just like to say thank you for all the subscribers, all who've liked uh, the videos, and to those who've given me feedback and asked questions and suggestions uh, for topics. Uh, please keep them coming. I will put my uh, email address. As always, that's the easiest way to uh, send me a note if there's anything you want uh, me to talk about. But today I want to talk about global warming potential. And I'm really going to focus on the numbers, how they're calculated, uh, how they're used, uh, some things you want to be on the lookout when you're looking at GWP uh, numbers for refrigerants. If you didn't catch my episode three, when I talked about the actual impact on the environment, the greenhouse effect, uh, how that is impacted by refrigerants and other gases in the atmosphere, how it's different from something like ozone depletion. I encourage you to jump out, check out that video, or you can check it out after this one. But that will really talk about the environmental issue. So today I want to go into the numbers, the GWPs, uh, what they mean, where you can find them, and how we're going to use them as an industry. So GWP stands for Global Warming Potential. And just to focus on that third word, potential, for a second. Uh, that should really uh, enforce upon us the need to keep the refrigerant inside the systems. They can only have an impact on the environment if they get out of the system. So things like good maintenance, good service practices, proper recovery, pulling vacuum, uh, reclaim, uh, venting, not venting, uh, all those important uh, procedures are really important to minimize the climate impact of, of our refrigerants. But going into the specific GWP numbers, they really, the GWP value, the number that's associated with a particular refrigerant, is really a measure of its impact in radiative forcing of the atmosphere. That is its ability to trap heat. So if we look at how those GWP numbers are calculated, they use pretty sophisticated atmospheric modeling uh, to do that these days. And uh, I'm not going to go into that detail. Uh, I'll put some links down in the comment section if you're in, interested in, in that type of uh, depth of discussion. But looking at GWP values, it's really two factors uh, that determine the GWP value. One is its uh, infrared absorption cross-section. And that's really a measure of how effective a molecule is at trapping heat. And that depends on the atoms, the chemical bonds that are in the molecule. And it turns out for most of the refrigerants we've been using over the past several decades, uh, those don't vary a lot from uh, refrigerant to refrigerant. But the other part of the equation is the atmospheric lifetime. And that really can vary quite a bit from very, very short atmospheric lifetimes to quite long. And if you have short atmospheric lifetimes or long or somewhere in the middle, that really is going to determine if your GWP value is high, somewhere in the middle, or, or very, very low. So I want to go into a little bit about uh, how atmospheric lifetimes are determined. And really that number is based on the atmospheric destruction reaction mechanisms. So it turns out for most of the refrigerants we've been using, the major atmospheric destruction mechanism is reaction with hydroxyl radicals, which are a, a reactive species found in the atmosphere, uh, with the, uh, the molecule. And what uh, the hydroxyl radical really likes to do is, is react with hydrogen in a molecule. And if you can have a hydrogen in your refrigerant, your hydroxyls can remove them from the atmosphere pretty quickly. You're going to have shorter atmospheric lifetimes. So I want to put a few examples here just to illustrate how our choice of chemistry in refrigerants can really determine the atmospheric lifetime and the GWP. So for example, we take a molecule with only fluorine on it and carbon, no hydrogen at all, something like C2F6 hexafluoroethane. And you can see it has no hydrogen, so they cannot have this atmospheric hydroxyl radical mechanism going on. Very, very long atmospheric lifetimes, very, very high GWP. Now we take a very similar molecule, but we just substitute a few hydrogen for some of the fluorine, and we have something like HFC134A, and you can see it's very susceptible to hydroxyl, uh, very short atmospheric lifetimes uh, compared to the, non the totally fluorinated species, and again, a lower GWP. And finally, moving to something like an HFO, if there's one thing hydroxyls like to react with more than hydrogen, it's an unsaturated or olefinic bond. So we can see HFO1234YF, 
very, very short atmospheric lifetime and very low GWP. It's even lower than CO2, which is the, uh, the basis for the whole system we use uh, for measuring GWP values. So when these global warming potential values are calculated, where can we find them? The go-to resource is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and I'll put the reference down below. You can look it up. Uh, it's very, very uh, authoritative and detailed discussion on all the atmospheric chemistry uh, involved with a lot of gases, including refrigerants. Uh, it's actually not a bad read if you're into that kind of thing. But what this uh, report has, and it comes out every few years, it's updated, is essentially tables and tables of refrigerants, molecules, with their GWP values and other uh, information, their lifetimes. Uh, the assessment reports, as they're called, uh, are numbered. So assessment report, or AR5, is the most current one. I think AR6 is going to be released in the not-too-distant future. But for regulatory purposes and everything we deal with, AR4 are the numbers you want to look at. AR4 was decided on by the industry and governments uh, around the world a while ago as they're going to be the standard table and the standard basis numbers that we uh, base regulations on. Uh, you also find something in there called the uh, integrated time horizon or ITH values. So you can have uh, 20, 50, 100 year ITH values for GWPs. And again, the industry has decided that 100 year ITH are the values to use. Um, you can look at the impact over shorter lifetimes, uh, shorter time frames, like 20 years, 500 years. But if you go to either extreme, you can get some kind of odd artifacts from the way the calculations are done uh, when you're trying especially to compare different refrigerants one to another. So 100 is a nice uh, round number. It's kind of in the middle. It gives us the best overall assessment uh, when we're looking at refrigerants. So again, it's the uh, chapter 8 of that IPCC report. And again, the AR4 100-year ITH values are the ones you want to look at. Uh, if you want to do a, a new blend, uh, you can take the individual components there and do a weighted average, and you can get GWP of just about any mixture that you want to have. So I just want to move a little bit beyond the simple GWP values because the climate impact of a refrigeration system is just not the refrigerant itself. More and more, the energy contribution uh, to global warming is uh, more and more a part of the equation. And there's a concept that's been around for a while called TWI, Total Equivalent Warming Impact. And that essentially combines the direct GWP contribution, that is the, the pounds of refrigerant and its individual GWP, um, basically from leaks, um, but also adds to that the energy contribution, that is all the CO2 that's generated to produce energy that's required uh, to operate the system over its lifetime. So again, if we focus too much on the refrigerant GWP and we ignore the uh, energy efficiency side, we could miss the big picture. It's clear with uh, the way the industry is moving to smaller charge sizes, lower leak rates, energy is more and more a part of the equation. It's probably over 50% of the total impact today for a lot of applications or most applications, even getting north of 90% of the climate impact is coming from energy consumption uh, versus the direct from the refrigerant itself. Uh, you can go even further, things like life cycle analysis or LCCP, life cycle climate performance, they take into effect uh, into account manufacturing, end of life, in addition to direct GWP and energy. So a number of different ways to look at that. Uh, and again, if you're trying to make uh, more holistic decisions and, and uh, uh, come up with a strategy at higher levels, uh, you really want to look at energy. It's more and more a part of the game. So obviously, uh, the GWP values are important when it comes to regulations. And, uh, you know, there are certain regulations in certain regions that are very prescriptive and sector or application based. Uh, for example, uh, automotive air conditioning, GWP needs to be less than 150 in that application. That's a very hard line, a bright line. A lot of the other uh, regulations like uh, FGAS and the Kigali are more a cap and reduction strategy. Uh, so it's important to understand those differences. Uh, California is proposing a kind of a hybrid uh, thing. I did an episode, I think it was episode seven, specifically around what California is proposing. 
for reducing GWP climate impact of refrigerants in uh, commercial refrigeration. You can check out that video. I, I stepped through some of the methodology. Um, I'm going to have one of my colleagues uh, come on here with me and hopefully in a, in a week or two and go through the difference between something we've gone through in the past like the Montreal Protocol and versus what we're really going to be facing in the future, which is more of a phase down and not a phase out, um, where we'll have the whole basket of refrigerants to choose from. We'll just have to make smart decisions in which uh, segments, which applications can move and the timing and when certain uh, applications can move. Other ones may need a little more time. But in general, we want to move the whole industry to lower uh, GWP, lower climate impact, lower environmental uh, impact from our systems, uh, including the refrigerants. So I encourage you to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss that episode when it comes out. And again, any questions you have, anything you want me to follow up on, give me a shout. I appreciate your taking your time to uh, check out this video and we'll be talking to you soon. Thanks. Mm -hmm.